Welcome to iForMRX, where we explore the evidence that matters to ambulatory care pharmacy practice. Today we're going to be discussing the manuscript entitled, Effect of Genotype Guided Warfarin Dosing on Clinical Events and Anticoagulation Control Among Patients Undergoing Hip or Knee Arthroplasty, also known as the GIF Study. The article was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, in September 2017. Leading the discussion is Paul Solinsky, a PGY2 ambulatory care pharmacy practice resident at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And joining Paul for a panel discussion about this important article are our invited guests, Dan Witt from the University of Utah and Edith Nutescu from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Warfarin is an oral anticoagulant that has been used in clinical practice over the past 60 years for the prevention and treatment of thromboembolism. While new oral anticoagulants have become available over the past few years, warfarin is still one of the most widely used anticoagulants due to the medical community's familiarity with it and due to its low cost. However, warfarin comes with many challenges, in part due to the wide variability in dosing requirements among patients. This can lead to difficulties in preventing thromboembolism while balancing the risk of adverse effects such as bleeding. As a result of the struggle, warfarin is the biggest cause of medication-related emergency room visits for older adults. In recent years, there has been interest in using pharmacogenetics to help minimize variability in dosing to ensure both safety and efficacy of this medication. Over the next few minutes, we will be discussing the role of pharmacogenetics in dosing of warfarin examine the design and the results of the GIFT study, and with the help of our expert panelists, discuss the future of pharmacogenetic testing for patients on warfarin. Genetic and pharmacoepidemiologic studies have identified certain genes that can affect the metabolism of warfarin. Around 2008, pharmacogenetic dosing algorithms were developed to help more accurately predict and achieve therapeutic anticoagulation levels based on certain genetic factors. However, the routine use of genotype-guided dosing of warfarin has been controversial due to its high cost, questionable practicality, and conflicting evidence about its efficacy. There are important genetic polymorphisms that can affect the metabolism of warfarin, including the cytochrome P450 enzymes CYP2C9 and CYP4F2, as well as the enzyme vitamin K epoxide reductase complex subunit 1. Alterations in the activities of these enzymes will affect either warfarin's metabolism or the vitamin K cycle. This can have effect on patients' international normalized ratio, or INR, which is used to assess the dose of warfarin. Important polymorphisms in CYP2C9 can significantly affect metabolism of warfarin. The CYP2C9 star 2 and star 3 alleles lead to decreased metabolism of warfarin, leading to higher concentrations. As a result, patients with these genotypes will require lower doses of warfarin. The VKRC1 gene encodes vitamin K epoxide reductase enzyme that warfarin targets. The VKRC1 variant, 1639A, is associated with increased sensitivity to warfarin. Patients who are a carrier of 1639A will commonly need a lower dose of warfarin to maintain therapeutic levels. The CYP4F2 is a cytochrome P450 enzyme isoform, which plays an important role in vitamin K oxidation in the vitamin K cycle. Genetic polymorphisms in this gene that encodes CYP4F2 can lead to changes in enzymatic activity, which affects the metabolism of vitamin K. The CYP4F2 star 3 variant is an enzyme that's associated with a higher warfarin dosing requirement needed to achieve therapeutic levels. This polymorphism is associated with patients of European or Asian descent. Warfarin's mechanism of action is an inhibitor of the enzyme VKORC1. As you can see from the figure, this enzyme is encoded by the VKORC1 gene. This enzyme is responsible for reactivating vitamin K, which in turn causes hypoactive clotting factors to become active clotting factors. Specifically, warfarin will target clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10 through this mechanism. Having a genetic polymorphism in the VKRC1 can affect the activity of the enzyme and is one of the major genetic reasons for the variability of dosing of warfarin in patients.
The CYP4F2 enzyme is responsible for the oxidation of vitamin K in the vitamin K cycle. Genetic variability of this enzyme can lead to altered enzymatic activity and result in altered warfarin doses needed to maintain a therapeutic INR. Warfarin is a racemic mixture of the enantiomers R-warfarin and S-warfarin. S-warfarin inhibits vitamin K apoptide reductase three to times more than R-warfarin. The predominant metabolic pathways of S-warfarin is through the CYP2C9, while R-warfarin is metabolized through a variety of other CYP enzymes. The CYP2C9 enzyme is encoded by the CYP2C9 gene. As previously stated, polymorphisms in this gene can affect warfarin metabolism and impact a patient's INR readings. Prior to the GIFT trial, there were nine major studies that looked at the impact of pharmacogenetics on warfarin management. The largest and most notable trials were the COAG and EUPAC trial. These trials are notable because of the conflicting results. The COAG trial was a double-blinded, randomized, controlled trial where patients newly started on warfarin either received genotype-guided dosing or conventional dosing. Genotype-guided dosing of warfarin did not improve the percent time in therapeutic range, also known as the PTTR, over the first four weeks of therapy. The EU-PAC study was a randomized controlled trial of patients newly started on warfarin who had either venous thromboembolism, known as VTE, or atrial fibrillation. During the first five days of warfarin treatment, patients were randomized to either genotype-guided dosing or conventional dosing. The PTTR was significantly improved in the genotype-guided dosing group, 67.4%, versus 60.3% in the conventional dosing group. A second study examined pharmacogenetic dosing of vitamin K antagonists that are similar to warfarin, acinkumarol and fenprocumarin. In this trial, PTTR did not improve between genotype-guided and conventional dosing groups over a 12-week period. Lastly, a meta-analysis of nine clinical trials published in the Cochrane Reviews showed that genotype-guided dosing did not significantly improve rates of PTTR, rates of supratherapeutic INR readings, rates of bleeding, or thrombotic events. Clinicians are still left with a number of unanswered questions about the role of pharmacogenetics in warfarin management. While the EU-PAC trials show that there could be a possible benefit, the COAG trial and subsequent meta-analyses suggest that there actually may not be a beneficial impact to these dosing algorithms. Another problem with the existing data is that the majority of patients included in these studies were Caucasians. Since rates of polymorphisms affecting warfarin vary among different racial groups, having a lower representation of minorities and only looking at a few polymorphisms responsible for the variability in patient response to warfarin may limit the generalizability of these results. Cost of pharmacogenetic testing is also a concern. While a 2017 review done by Verbellin and colleagues showed that pharmacogenetic testing can be somewhat cost-effective, insurance coverage of these tests vary. For example, Medicare does not currently cover pharmacogenetic testing, and out-of-pocket costs for these tests can cost anywhere from $250 to $500. There's also practical concerns for implementing pharmacogenetic testing into clinical practice. Clinicians may not think to obtain pharmacogenetic testing on patients who are newly started to, on warfarin, or they may not be able to follow up with patients in a timely manner to use the results to guide warfarin dosing. The GIFT trial was designed to answer some of these remaining questions about the roles of pharmacogenetics in warfarin dosing. The trial was a multi-centered, randomized clinical trial, which patients 65 and older who were undergoing elective knee or hip arthroplasty would be randomized to conventional warfarin dosing or genotype-guided dosing. Patients and study personnel were blinded to group assignment and genotype, but not warfarin dosing. 1,650 patients were randomized to receive genotype-guided dosing of warfarin or clinically guided dosing of warfarin. However, a number of participants in both groups were excluded after randomization, so there was a total of 808 patients in the genotype guided dosing group and 789 patients in the clinically guided dosing groups, 
that were included in the primary analysis. Patients in each group were further randomized to an INR goal of 1.8 or 2.5. This was done because in 2003, the PREVENT trial showed that patients with idiopathic venous thromboembolism and a goal INR range of 1.5 to 2 with a target INR of 1.8 had an acceptable risk-benefit ratio. Although this trial has excluded orthopedic patients, this goal has since been endorsed by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. The primary endpoint in the GIF trial was a composite endpoint of major bleed, INR greater than 4, death within 30 days, or confirmed VTE within 60 days of arthroplasty. Secondary endpoints included any adverse events, the patient's therapeutic warfarin dose, INR control reported as PTTR, or 90-day follow-up of composite endpoints. The baseline demographics were fairly well balanced between the two groups. The average participant in the study was 72 years old, female and white. About three times as many patients underwent knee arthroplasty compared to hip arthroplasty. The genotypes were collected among all participants included in this trial. It's important to note that in the study, the genotypes between the clinically guided dosing group and the genotype guided dosing groups were similar. The majority of participants in the study were homozygous for CYP2C9 star 2 and star 3 allele. These alleles are more common among Caucasians and are much less prevalent among Asians and African Americans. About 45% of the participants in this trial were heterozygous for VKRC1 star 2. Compared to other genotypes, homozygosity for VKRC star 2 is associated with lower dosing requirements for warfarin. The CYP2C9 genetic variability accounts for about 10% of the dosing variability of warfarin, while genetic variability of VKORC1 accounts for about 30% of variability in warfarin dosing. One component of the primary composite endpoint occurred in 87 participants in the genotype-guided group and 116 participants in the clinically-guided group. This was statistically significant. If we examine the individual components of the composite endpoint, we notice that the driving factor for statistical significance was having an elevated INR of 4 or greater. Looking back at secondary outcomes, there was less major or non-major clinically relevant bleeding in the genotype-guided dosing group. However, this difference was not statistically significant. There was also no significant difference in symptomatic major adverse events, including major bleeding, symptomatic DVT, or symptomatic PE. By day 90, the composite endpoint had occurred less in the genotype-guided dosing group compared to the clinically-guided dosing group. This difference was statistically significant. There was also a statistically significant improvement in the percentage time and therapeutic range for patients in the genotype-guided dosing group compared to the clinically-guided dosing group. This improvement was seen in all patients as well as a high-risk subgroup of patients, the authors concluded that genotype-guided dosing of warfarin helped reduce the incidence of adverse outcomes compared to clinically-guided dosing of warfarin, which is largely due to having a supertherapeutic INR and more time spent in therapeutic range. There are some limitations to this conclusion. The investigators were not blinded to the warfarin dose, therefore it is possible for the investigator to infer the group placement of the individual. Next, the primary reason why the composite endpoint was statistically significant was due to the fact that there was a reduction in the incidence of a patient with an INR of 4 or higher. Lastly, there are some concerns about the generalizability of the study to other populations. Most of the trial participants were enrolled at major academic medical center. Also, the mean age of the patients was around 72 years old, ma making this an older population that was studied. Finally, knee and hip replacements is an elective procedure. Therefore, genetic testing could be a part of the anticoagulation planning before patients undergo the procedure. This trial did not include any newly diagnosed patients with acute VTE or patients who were already on warfarin. Despite these results, there are still important unanswered questions. This trial took place in individuals where the timing of anticoagulation initiation was relatively predictable 
This is in contrast to cl- the clinical uncertainty associated with timing of anticoagulation initiation in patients with new onset atrial fibrillation or VTE. In addition, it is unclear whether the results of the GIFT study can be applied to patients with active VTE since the participants included in the study were only receiving anticoagulation for the prevention of VTE. Finally, it's important to consider the cost-benefit ratio of genetic testing. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services funded the genetic testing conducted in the GIFT trial, so it's important to see if these results will impact insurance coverage. Now to help answer some questions in regards to the GIFT trial, I'd like to introduce our expert panel for a roundtable discussion. Today we have Dr. Edith A. Nutestu, who is an Associate Professor for Pharmacy Systems and Outcomes at University of Illinois at Chicago and Director for the Center of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomic Research. Next, we have Dr. Daniel Witt, who is a clinical professor and chair of the Department of Pharmacotherapy at University of Utah College of Pharmacy. He was a panel member of the 2012 CHESS Consensus Guideline for Antithrombotic Therapy and is currently serving as a panel member for venous thromboembolism guidelines being developed by the American Society of Hematology. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining today. So the first question I'd like to ask is, what did you think overall about the study? Did you find the results surprising? I thought the study was really well done. I thought that uh, the results were pretty much in line with uh, what I was expecting. And I think that they're a valuable contribution to our understanding about how pharmacogenomics might be able to help us correctly dose patients that are taking orphan therapy following a joint replacement. You know, I would agree with Dr. Witt. I, some of the positives from uh, my perspective were that this was the largest trial to date in this area. It was also nice to see that they applied a slightly larger genetic panel than previous trials. So they included the CYP4F2. Also, comparing it to some of the previous trials, the modified warfarin dosing regimens were extended beyond the four to five days, what we've seen previously, to 11 days now. So, uh, and also the fact that they used a uh, dosing algorithm versus usual care, although I think we'll circle back to that and, and discuss pros and cons around that. But in terms of picking a comparator that's a bit better than usual care, that was nice to see. So I, I thought the trial had a lot of strengths and it, it was pretty well executed. So the next question I have is that the primary outcome in this study was statistically significant, and this was a composite of major bleeding, INR greater than four, incidence of venous thromboembolism or death. Now, the primary outcome was primarily the statistical significance was driven by the fact that the majority of the outcome was an INR of greater or equal to four. Does this matter that some of the other endpoints in this composite didn't meet statistical significance and the fact that the study was empowered to meet some of those individual endpoints rather than the composite endpoint. You know, if you had to power a study just based on the, the really meaningful outcome of a major bleeding episode or a venous thromboembolic episode, the trial would probably never get done just because it would take way too many patients to enroll in that. So sometimes there's what would be the, the gold standard and there's what you can feasibly do. I think that in this case, the fact that the main outcome was an INR greater than four, in this particular patient population, that can be a pretty important result because one of the worst things that can happen after a joint replacement surgery is bleeding into that joint. It can just lead to many, many very unfavorable consequences up to and including the the need to revise that joint and, and redo the surgery. So I think it's an important outcome. It's a surrogate outcome that has been linked with the risk for bleeding, especially in people that have fresh uh, surgical wounds that may be prone to bleeding. So I think that outcome was chosen with care and was appropriate. And the fact that that was the main thing that drove the statistical significance, you take that for what it's worth. And in this case, I think it it can be an important outcome. 
Yes, I would definitely agree with Dr. Witt, especially that this population was an elderly population. So those randomized into the study were older than 65. And when we look at what is the major driver of emergency room visits in this patient population is warfarin-related complications, especially bleeding, right? And so an INR of four in this population, especially in this surgical population, as pointed out already by Dr. Webb, uh, could be significant. You know, while not statistically significant, there was also a fairly strong trend towards lower major bleeding complications. So two events versus eight events. Uh, So two events in the genotype group, eight events in the control group. The p-value was 0.06. And then when you look at the combined major bleeding and clinically relevant and non-major bleeding, 57 versus 74 events. Again, it's a numeric trend, uh, granted, not statistically significant. Fairly large confidence intervals there. But the question is, you know, could this point towards a clinical benefit? So knowing that uh, the trial was not powered to detect these individual clinical endpoints, I think the trends, though, are pointing in the right direction. Uh, Next question I have is based on the current recommendations of the Clinical Pharmacogenetics Implementation Consortium, their most current guidelines on pharmacogenetic testing in warfarin recommends all non-Black patients who are new to warfarin undergo pharmacogenetic testing. Do you think the results from this trial support that recommendation? I don't know that I would go that far. It makes a lot of sense for me in this particular patient population One, you know that they're going to be a need for warfarin, and it's a very high-risk situation. There's a very high risk for thromboembolic complication associated with joint replacement surgery, and there's also a great risk for bleeding complications. And so in, in this situation, I think the factors combine together favorably to make genetic testing in this setting a lot more reasonable than somebody that comes in and, and say with atrial fibrillation or venous thromboembolism, where you only discover that warfarin therapy is needed right there at the moment. And depending on how fast genetic testing could come back and give you the results, you may have already gotten feedback from an INR or two that would give you a lot of the same type of information. So I wouldn't lump all indications for warfarin therapy together, but I do think that in the the case of joint replacement surgery, that this is one of the areas where it makes the most sense to do pharmacogenetic testing. This trial has to be put in context of our previous knowledge, especially in context of COAG and the two UPAC trials uh, published a few years ago. And so together, the knowledge to date uh, should drive implementation in clinical practice. I would not generalize this to the point to say that now every single patient who receives warfarin needs to be genotyped. So I don't think we're there yet based on this one single trial. Uh, But I do agree that if genotyping testing is available and accessible in this patient population, it makes sense because you could have the results available at the time of that first dose, ideally pinpointing that right dose, avoiding those high INRs. And if I could if I could just jump in a little bit on that, I think that over time you have seen the cost of a, of a genetic screen that could provide a lot of information about potential SIP polymorphisms that could affect drug metabolism. As that cost becomes less and less, there may come a day when this information, rather than being drawn just in time for the for the surgery or whatever, uh, it might get drawn just in case, meaning that uh, everybody gets a screen and we already know what their information is. And if you've got that information available to you because somebody has already gotten the genotyping, then obviously you ought to use that if it's available to you. Great. My next question involves patients with African ancestry. Um, In this trial, there's about a little over 100 patients with African ancestry included, um, in the EU-PACT and COAG trials, 
There was also noted to be a small number of patients with African history included in this in the trial. So given the small number of Black and African ancestry patients, do you feel like the results from the study would support the current recommendation and support the current view from the CPIC that routine genotyping should not be done in this patient population? Of course, as we know, none of the trials to date have included the CYP2C9 variants specifically that are more frequent in people of African ancestry. Specifically, when we look at CYP2C9 star 5, star 6, star 8, star 11, those are more common variants in African Americans that uh, are known to contribute significantly to driving dosing. So because of this, the generalizability of the GIFT trial to this population at this point remains uncertain, right? Because we do not have this African-American specific SNPs included in this trial, like in previous trials. And so genotype-based algorithms, of course, should incorporate these variants if they are to be applied to patients of African ancestry. And the clinical algorithm and the genotype algorithm that was used in this trial did not incorporate this African-American SNPs. Now, there are trials actually currently ongoing. The ACCOUNTS trial is a seven-center trial ongoing in the U.S. Uh, My institution is one of the seven sites, and we're actually testing an African-American specific algorithm incorporating some of these uh, SNPs that have been demonstrated to drive those things. So, We have emerging information in a few years. Hopefully, we'll know more. But to answer your question, at this point, the data that we have is not necessarily generalizable to African-American patients. Okay. So, it seems like there needs to be more studies in this area, and they're currently ongoing. Do you think that there's any general policy uh, implications of this study? How do you think it's going to impact how patients receive genetic testing and if this will lead to more access for patients getting genetic testing done. So I think we've already seen some policy changes in terms of the CPIC guidelines that have already incorporated the results of this trial, and they're recommending uh, genetic testing for non-African-American patients. As the price goes down, yes, you know, access will increase, and we'll have to see how CMS will incorporate the results of this. Obviously, CMS um, has covered the testing for the GIFT trial, and they're considering at, at the moment of whether reimbursement would be provided in this context. And the one thing I might add to that, that I don't know if it's a policy decision or not, but I would love to see the people who make uh, electronic medical records or pharmacy management systems be able to, if somebody does have genetic information available, that that then gets incorporated similarly to what you would have with the drug interaction screen. So if somebody had a CYP2C9 polymorphism that made them way more sensitive to warfarin therapy, that ought to be in the pharmacy system so that when a drug like warfarin or another drug that was metabolized through that pathway got prescribed, it's alerting somebody. And I think that's right now one of the big gaps that needs to get addressed is how do we, if we have this information available and like we've been talking about, the day will come when most people will have this information How do we then make that work seamlessly with the systems that we have available so that it flags potentially harmful situations that might increase risk for patients? The next questions I have is in regard to the cost effectiveness of this study, or how would you estimate that? Based on this trial, 26 people needed to undergo genetic testing to prevent one of the composite endpoint. And that was primarily an INR greater than four. Do you think this would be a cost-effective strategy for maintaining INR control? So I I think that the cost-effectiveness of this strategy needs to be further assessed. As we've mentioned already, with the availability and widespread use of of genotyping, uh, costs might be coming down, so then things might be tipped in the right direction. We also have to factor in the increase in usage of direct oral anticoagulants. And so at this point, it is really not clear how this particular strategy would be incrementally beneficial from either an efficacy or cost standpoint in light of also considering the direct oral anticoagulants. 
So I think we can all agree that uh, this approach has some clinical utility and especially in the orthopedic surgery population. So the short answer is cost effectiveness has not been demonstrated yet. Something interesting is that orthopedic surgeons in the U.S., at least the ones that I've been working with, they don't like DOAX. And uh, part of the reason is, is that they have the feeling, whether or not it's based in scientific fact or not, uh, that they cause more bleeding. And the same is true with low molecular weight heparin therapy, which is actually what the current chest recommendations favor. And so given their preference, many orthopedic surgeons like warfarin therapy. And I think it's partially, I'm being a little bit uh, crass here, but it's partially because it doesn't become therapeutic for three or four days after the surgery, and it, it likely reduces the risk for bleeding associated. And an orthopedic surgeon's worst problem is bleeding into that newly implanted joint. Pulmonary embolism or thrombo uh, DVT becomes internal medicine's problem. And so, you know, they like warfarin therapy. And when given the choice at a place where I used to work, we, we, we were managing the warfarin therapy, which was incredibly, incredibly labor intensive in an orthopedic surgery population because you put somebody on warfarin and then you tell them you can't get in a car for the next three weeks. So it becomes very hard for them to get an INR drawn. So you just got to think about the practicalities of actually putting somebody that has limited mobility on warfarin therapy and expecting them to get their INRs drawn. So that oftentimes necessitates that you send somebody out to their home to draw their blood, and that just factors in additional costs. So that, uh, as was pointed out, there's many inputs into that cost effectiveness. And so, yeah, that, that, the question about cost effectiveness, I think, is a really complicated one. And it would be interesting if somebody could sort of factor in all of the potential options and, and figure out which one is actually the most cost effective at the end of the day. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a, a complicated study with lots of moving parts. Well, thank you both of you for your insight and expertise regarding the GIF trial. So it seems like in summary that this this trial shows that there's some clinical utility of doing pharmacogenetic testing, especially in orthopedic patients undergoing hip and knee replacement. But there should be some more studies in regards to African ancestry patients and whether this could be a cost-effective strategy going forward and, and making this more generalized to other indications like venous thromboembolism and atrial fibrillation. But I would like to thank both of you for your time and expertise assessing the GIF trial. Thank you for listening to this vidcast from iForumRx, where we explore the evidence that matters to ambulatory care pharmacy practice. You can become a member of iForumRx. It's free. Sign up today. And many thanks to the volunteers of iForumRx who give a gift of time, their talents, and the financial contributions that make this site possible.